Alright Kings of War players, in this video we're going to talk about how to deal with those pesky flying units and Alpha Strike armies. So if you have problems with those, don't go away. Hello there! I like to watch battle reports to get better at games. So I started making short, summarized battle reports that focus on learning points. So welcome to my channel, Newbie Dice. Do like, subscribe and hit the bell icon if you enjoy my videos. And welcome back. So if you have been following my videos, you would know that I'm more of a flying and alpha strike player. So in this video, I'd like to share with you what are the tactics that I've seen that are pretty effective against my army and play style. And yeah, so it's from the player point of view, the flying and alpha strike player point of view, but I've tried to give you as many tips as I can. It is quite a complex topic. So I hope by the end of this video, you will be able to gain more insights and be able to so let's talk about the types of flyers out there firstly we have our chaff which are nimble some of them have have flying right like the gargoyles harpies and pegasus sometimes they don't have flying but they are still quite nimble they usually cost 100 points or less and then you have your monster or titan typo over there should be 75 mm so monsters they are flying and nimble they are your beast of nature that's one of the most popular ones you have your general on wing beast from kingdoms of men and you have your mounted on um, wing arrowless that's in your league of rodia and your the upcoming halflings as well so titans are your dragon class they usually cost about 300 points or more and they are 75 mm so the thing about 75 mm is it's significantly larger and sometimes it's hard to get into juicy tight spaces Okay, you have your flying hordes, they are your hammers, they are your flying hammers, usually 18 attacks, melee 3 plus with CS2. The thing about them is that they are not nimble, so they have a long tread range, they can fly over stuff, but they can't get into very interesting positions, they just punch very far and very hard. So you have your Order of the Forsaken, Dracon Riders, um, Basileus, uh, Elohai with a Brew of Strength for example, that would also work. So the first mistake that I see uh, players make, and this will be my first two tips. The first tip leads into the second. The first thing is do not allow him to fly forwards 20 inches and then be able to turn and face the side of your entire army without any consequences. Okay, tip number two following that is to take note of his 10 inch nimble flying zone or the 20 inch turn and face zone. Okay, so over here I have two armies that I laid out. This is my Order of the Green Lady army on top and the Red King army below. Okay, I just loaded up a random map and a random scenario. It happens to be push and all the tokens are on the center unit. Okay, but let's look at this Beast of Nature on the side. So this little bear with wings here is my Beast of Nature. It is deployed here. And this will be the upcoming position. So I'm going to show you this. So if the Order of the Green Lady player goes first, notice this barrel, uh, this beast of nature. You could fly 20 inch forward and do one pivot. Okay. And when it's landing in this position, if you look at that, it is out of the front arc of this shock troops. So if you allow him to do that at the top of one, this is already spells very big trouble for you. Because you are not able to threaten him and you allowed him to fly 20 inches up. And then you see he's threatening the flank of your entire battle group over here. Okay, So this is a very bad position you want to be in. So always make sure, especially if he puts a nimble flyer at the edge of the board, that 20 inch fly out and turn, you are able to catch that. You don't have to catch the front of the unit, you just need to make sure you catch the rear of the unit. So minimally, your shock troop should be at least something like this. Right, so that you can clip the rear of its base when it comes forward. Take note, you can turn up to 90. So let's just check. Yep, this you are still able to clip. So you can be all the way up to here. Because sometimes, you know, as a foot infantry army or slower army, you don't want to deploy your units too far out to the side. So at least it needs to be here to catch him at the fly 20. Alright, if you don't, you might start to panic. <laughs> okay, so maybe you will start to turn your entire force like this. Maybe you move up some and then you turn, right? To be able to face him. That is also a mistake. 
because notice the way that the beast of nature does this okay then it could actually fly 20 inches past your entire army like this and then he'll turn to face the center of your army now which you'll be in trouble because usually there's pressure from the front so you can't turn to face the side so this is this spells very big trouble to you okay so if you do a knee jerk reaction and start to turn your units to face remember he can just fly 20 inches over your entire army as well so this requires some pre-planning from the flying player as well that i pivot my unit in an angle that it's threatening the enemy but at the same time it has a 20 inch straight fly path so now the first thing you have to deal with this threat right is to play something that can charge it so it's either your shock troops are a little bit further out or if you feel that you don't want to spend an entire shock troop regiment on it i could place like a brute here and that will be able to threaten it take note though sometimes i don't mind being charged in the flank let's say i'm already here facing the center of your army so even if your brute charges me in the flank if you are in a position that will charge me in the flank I might take it because that's six attacks on the flank I'm most likely gonna survive this and my frontage is not blocked so I can still charge what's I still have choices of what to charge okay granted if I'm disordered I lose my nimble I lose my fly but if I can still threaten 20 inches and within one pivot get to my target I'm still fine with that, right? I just cannot jump over units to get to the units behind. But if in front of me, there's still a lot of juicy targets, I'm also fine with that. So sometimes you got to take note of that. I can still charge the flank of this shock troop, for example. Then you'll be, uh, you'll be a world of hurt, right? So that also applies when you have an individual. So another technique is to have an individual behind and then you can charge it, right? So, but then look, if, I, if you charge this cavalry unit, individual in the frontage is not blocked once again and he can still charge out 20 inches just that he couldn't jump fly over units and he doesn't have nimble within one pivot if he can still charge the targets he wants still fine okay especially with individuals they don't double or triple their attacks in the side or rear so sometimes the amount of damage you deal to threaten it is also not enough okay if your cavalry was more in front and then you charge it in the front that would uh, be much better because you disorder it even if you're not mighty he couldn't he couldn't move through you and he has to charge you back uh, having an individual unit will be quite handy because you can have that 360 degree arc you don't need to plan so much in advance as long as you know that he's within 16 inch of you you can charge but once again if you put it at, a, at this corner here it will charge its rear which might not stop it so if you want to play an individual you might want to put it somewhere here somewhere between your flank and your flanking forces and your central forces so that you can charge the flyer in the front okay so somewhere here would be ideal that brings me to tip number two i'm just gonna go back to here okay take note of the 10 inch nimble zone and the 20 inch turn and phase zone so i've illustrated in this red lines over here so for those who are not familiar with universal battles there's this grid lines that shows you the threat zone so i've drawn it out so this beast of nature this 10 inch zone is this semicircle over here okay or rather this quarter circle because the rest is at the edge over here and so this 10 inch zone is significant because it allows me to turn and face that direction move 10 and once i reach there i can once again turn to face the direction i want and that is to maximize the things i want to threaten so being able to turn and face a, a ideal position to threaten as much as possible is very important for this flying unit because if i fly out and i can't turn to face the enemy i wouldn't be looking at things right so th in this case i'm looking at the tank one tango and that's it so i need to be able to turn at the end of my flight so that i can threaten as many things as possible so other than this 10 inch bubble right the straight path is also something that I can fly and at any point along this path, I can then turn to threaten the enemy. Okay, so up to 20. So firstly, you have this semicircle. If this was not the edge of the board, this semicircle, followed by this straight corridor where I can turn to face the enemy 
at the end of this movement. And you see that I have this uh, arc over here also. Why? Because um, I could fly, for example, 14, let's say 15 inches, right? And then I can turn 90 degrees and I can fly another 5 inches out. So this is not full, you know, this is not being able to face exactly where I want, but at least I can still face the side. Okay, so take note of this, especially this landing zone. Sometimes though, you line up your new units to threaten it, but you also need to take care of where it can go if it doesn't engage with you. So especially if you can hop, hop over your whole entire defense and then threaten something else, that will, be, that will spell trouble for you. So what's our solution? So you can do double layering, screening or delaying with one unit. So I'm going to demonstrate each of these situations here. So double layering is like this. You have two units. Okay, so the first unit will move up aggressively to threaten the enemy. Let's say you go first. Okay, and then the second unit will stay out of the 20 inch threat range. So I have this measurement over here. This beast of nature now has to make a decision. If you charge the brute, you are not likely to kill it. Or maybe you do. Even if you kill it, the shock troops will come into you. Okay, and the shock troops should win that uh that exchange because it's gonna hit you twice. Uh if you does if you don't kill it, it's gonna charge you, double charge you, and that will work. So something like that. If the beast of nature doesn't charge the brute, even if it flies 20, it'll be within the threat range of the shock troops, so it can't turn to face this way, right? It's gonna eat a flank from the shock troops, which has a good chance of wavering it at least. Okay, so this is double layering. The brute is only speed 12, so it doesn't threaten the beast of nature at this point, but if you are a chef that's a little bit faster or has a wild charge, so then you threaten it. So even then, okay, the beast of nature, as long as it comes up a bit, is going to be charged by the brute. Right? So it has to respect the brute. Okay, and then the brute will charge. Right? Even if it's hindered, hopefully you do one wound to ground it, so it has no choice but to charge the brute. And then you follow up with the shock troops to charge it next turn. If the opponent goes first, it's likely to be outside of your brute's threat range. So maybe you will fly up. Uh, until here, just 12 and a half inches away from your brute. Okay, I'm not looking at the vermin type right now because uh, the vermin type might be in range. Uh, no, so it has a wild charge D3, so maximum 15. Okay, so you will be like just out of your brute's threat range. So, same thing, you want to push up your brute, and if you can, if these shock troops can be can go out of the threat range, that would be great by moving back okay in this case it's still not out of its threat range okay so then what now so he might still charge your shock troops and hopefully it's not going to one round it the shock troops will at least have one round of hitting it and then you can position other stuff to get ready to charge it so for example this brute over here position the brute to charge it because very likely there's still certain threats in front okay so you want to be careful of that in a more ideal situation where the beast of nature will not charge you is that you have something that defends the, against the flyer from jumping over your army so you might have deployed these shock troops further back to begin with so maybe this is your deployment with one unit quite far back uh, the best is if you have a faster unit because if the beast of nature decides to just fly off somewhere else this unit will be very far from the battle so if you have a faster unit or maybe you put the brute behind that would be great as well okay so even when he does this uh you could fly back for example and yep they are out of threat range you can even shuffle further back to be out of threat range but as of now it's already out so you might have this corner protector over here okay so even if it flies let's say this way and moves 20 still well within your threat range to charge right so sometimes you pull one unit further back so that it doesn't it's not able to hopscotch jump over the first unit and charge the second unit behind the beast if the beast of nature ignores the brute and starts swinging to the center 
your brute can then move up at the double 12 inches. Maybe not in one round, but in two rounds, you eventually threaten the rear or the flank of the beast of nature. So that is something that he has to take care of. Okay, so that's your double layering technique. Second thing, screening, that's quite straightforward. You don't want it to charge your shock troops, for example. And then you have a uh, vermin tied in front to force it to charge the vermin tide first. Okay, because this is not the extent of my flanking force. This, I'm just showing you the examples with this piece of nature. And so there's also the rest of this army which might have uh, come forward. So definitely combine charges into the shock troops would kill it. So that's why you want to screen against that. So it will be forced to kill your vermin tide. And hopefully you have something positioned to threaten the front and the flank. Yep, then you are able to handle the charge. So what is delaying with one unit? So that is if you don't want to spend too many resources and units to guard against the flyers, you only have one. Suppose you want to have your units more central. So you just delay with one unit. So for example, I just have these shock troops here. Uh, this one brute protecting the flank. Okay, I would probably want to be somewhere here. Okay, this is ideal against one flyer, right? Not this whole flank of uh, fast units here. So let's say you're only dealing with the beast of nature. So my brute is um, less than half the points of your beast of nature, but I am keeping the beast of nature honest by saying, hey, there's a threat here. Okay, so the beast of nature can't just uh, scoot off and face the flank because then you'll be charged by the brute. Okay. So just by having these 75 points here, you are delaying the beast of nature. So he might angle this way. So he can charge the brute or he can charge something else. Okay. So at this point, let's say he has flown to be just out of 12 inches of your brute. So what do you do about this? So take note that your brute will definitely lose the exchange to the beast of nature. On normal dice right so then you can have a few options to delay it further so either you move sideways get into this terrain so that will cause it to take more time to deal with you not likely to one shot you and then you can punch back and maybe it will take more than two rounds to get rid of you okay or you could try to pull backwards so what does pulling backwards do so look it's still in track range right but by pulling backwards, right, you are forcing him to charge into this corner of the map that is very far from uh, the rest of the battle. So let's say I'm even all the way down here. Okay, maybe it takes two rounds to kill off this brute. This is, uh, on average dice, I think it'll take at least two rounds. 11, 13, defense, 5. Right, so you're only gonna deal three wounds. About three wounds on average. So yeah, even two rounds might not kill it. Okay, so by the time you turn, kill the brute and turn, perhaps the rest of the forces has already, you know, been fighting in the center already. So yeah, it's still uh, like just this unit. Okay, so it turns around, everything is out of 20 inches away. So it still needs to take one round of flying and then threaten your army. And then by then, hopefully you have, because when it turns around here, right, then you can start to prepare something else to charge it by turning this brute around. So that when it flies to this part, your brute can now handle it, okay, by just one unit, okay, by this 75 points. Let's say he does this, you pull, and this, this brute is nimble, right, so I'm going to pull him away, so it's 3 inches, so let's say it, it attacks me, okay, and then I'm going to back up another 3 inches, and then it's going to charge me again, right, so what if it doesn't charge me again? Uh, Let's say I pull up 3 inches, doesn't charge me again, it decides to turn around and fly off, then that's another risk. So you might want to punch it back instead. Okay? So you might just turn and fly off, or maybe fly 10. Right? And then turn again and face the rear of your army. So that's another risk you have to take note of, so you might want to punch it back. So it depends on the situation. Maybe this is a top of 2 moment, right? You uh, he kills you top of 3 and hopefully by then your forces are out of 20 inches of that piece of nature 
right? So Tau of 4 is going to fly to position and then it's going to only contribute to the army in the 5th, 6th and the possible 7th round. Okay, by using just one brute to delay. So that is if you don't want to spend too many points to delay. But looking at the opponent, if he has committed such a significant force to the flank, you should uh, commit some force to defend it. So always uh, question yourself, am I here to delay this force as long as possible or am I here to defeat this force? So, there are, so if you're delaying, just use as little points as possible. So that means you have more forces elsewhere. Okay, tr just try to hold them out as long as possible and then you are able to uh, win on the other side of the battle. So in this uh, battle report, I have an example over here. This is actually a 2v2 game. So this bottom side is actually Redkin and Night Stalkers versus the top Abyssal Dwarves and Brother Mark. I'm just going to zoom into this part of the battle. So the opponent has a dragon on the flank. He took away the model because it's very big. And so it just left this cliff where the dragon is supposed to be on. But this dragon is threatening the flank. So what we did in response is that the Night Stalker player has a speed 10 chef, right? The phantoms over here is threatening the dragon. But if the dragon were to charge the phantoms, you have two threats de to deal with. So let me draw that out. This is uh, shock troops. Okay, and, and then there's a dread fiend over here, as well as a brute enforcer over here. So if you were to kill the dragon, I was kill the phantoms, even if it did, there will be two forces coming in. Okay, so he will get at least flanked by one of them because of the angles that they are so far out, right? So it's not a good proposition for the dragon to be in. But at the same time, if he peels back, he would have been charged by the phantoms. And that's exactly what happened. Sorry, this is the earlier one. Okay, so he decided not to charge, he just shuffles around. And then the phantoms charge in with the dread fiend over here. It's a little bit dark, but the dread fiend is over here, threatening the flank of the dragon. Okay, with the brute enforcer in front. So that ties up the dragon for quite a long time. So what could the dragon player have done, right? Actually, there are, there's a troop of gargoyles over here. He might have placed the troop of gargoyles here. So then the dragon cannot be charged. That might be an interesting tactic, but these gargoyles the opponents decide to save them up because they want to use it to chaff the shock troops instead by landing in front and blocking them and that's exactly what happened actually uh, I didn't have the slides for that but the, the gargoyles eventually flew up here and blocked off these shock troops and these scarecrows at the same time which is quite a worthy trade as well so that's why he did not use the gargoyles to block so which uh, I'm going to show you the example of using the chef in front of the flyer or the flying player. So this is another game. Okay, so this is Redkin versus Brother Mark. I have this over here, this demon spawn and vermin type hanging around the flank for the very long time. We have been moving back and forth, back and forth. I think this is somewhere in the third turn. And he has this cavalry unit over here, the Exemplar Hunter. It hurts Titans quite a bit and it's screened behind a unit, so I cannot charge it, and if I fly over, that guy will charge me, right? So I've been hanging around, actually I was trading lightning bolts with his wizard, and I managed to roll pretty high, I took out the wizard, so I was like, okay, now I'm free to, to continue to lightning bolt. So a few things happened here. The opponent uh, marched up this troop of paladins to block both my regiment and my horde of shock troops. So with this maneuver, it sort of forced my hand. So then it's Ogre Palace Guard started, these are the Ogre Palace Guard, it started to shuffle behind because now I can't charge the Ogre Palace Guard, it's, it's lining up to charge me next round. So at the same time, he started to push the Paladin troops to screen his cavalry to threaten my uh, demon spawn. So at that point, I found a uh, op opportunity. Okay, so what happened here? So let's talk about the center first. I flank charged the Paladin troops so now this regiment of shock troops is out in the open, right? It's, it's within this uh, point of no return, blows are going to be traded. I kept this like that, and these shock troops, I think they were within the Ogre Palace Guard charge range, but uh, they're not going to die in one swing, so not too worried. 
and then I position uh, something to flank it if he, he does. So this is not a, a ideal trade for him. Okay, then at the same time, I know that something he's going to commit something over here, right? Something's going to happen. Action is going to go down. Okay, so what I did was with my Vermintide, I charged the Paladin through. But that allows my my Demon Spawn to fly forward behind the Paladin troop. So the Vermintide moved up and then the Demon Spawn moved up behind. So now I have uh, threatening the center of the board even more with that 20 inches. So I'm able to threaten all the way over here. If I was out here, I wouldn't be able to threaten the Ogres in the middle. Okay, so his Exemplar Hunter can't charge me. So he's, he's sort of stuck. He can't he can't charge my demon spawn and now I'm threatening the center of the board, the two ogres and this spear horde over here. Okay, so what happens next? So when it took care of my uh, shock troops regiment, it has to face the horde, right? And now because of that, it has uh, faced its flank against my demon spawn. So this is going to go down, right? And especially when he turned the other horde of uh, ogre palace guard to face me, that's worse because when I fly away, he couldn't deal with it. And I'm gonna just charge in over here. Okay. Even if there was not such a juicy target over here, I could easily fly 20 forwards and then turn and face the rear of his entire army. Okay, but uh, there's this uh, Exemplar Hunter over here. So I will eat one charge from the Exemplar Hunter. It will probably hurt but not kill me, especially if I'm fresh. Okay, I would be disordered, but I'm still free to charge 20 inches in front of me without nimble or flying. Okay, so these are some of the considerations you have to think of when you're dealing with flyers. So yep, this one charge in. So next we talk about the flying regiments or hordes. These are your flying hammers. Okay, they are usually deployed uh, about one third down the flank or in the center. Okay. It's most likely to guard against the center but charge into the flanking forces. The ideal position for this order of second for second would be somewhere around here. Ignoring terrain, right? It'd be something around here. Okay. Why do we like to position this on this one third mark? So let me just draw that out. Okay, so one third down the center of the map. Okay, and then this is two thirds. Okay, so I could deploy the Forsaken here as well, somewhere here on the right side. Okay, but why do we like this one third mark? That's because by being down this one third, it allows us to threaten both the middle and the flank. Okay, so you will probably shuffle up a little bit, staying out of threat range of everything. Right, so my threat area, I'm going to draw it out, is huge here all the way okay so this allows me to threaten units in the center and units all the way to the extreme flank okay unless this brute run past my front arc okay so maybe i wouldn't move so far up okay i'm ignoring this forest for now for the purpose of this illustration Okay. If I were to be along the flank, I'm just gonna put it here. The problem with that is I, I'm wasting about half my threat area. Okay, because I still have this 20 inch uh, arc over here. But you see, it hits the edge of the table. This whole part is wasted. Okay. This whole area is wasted. Yeah, so I'm wasting this whole area that I could potentially threaten. That's why people like to have it on the one third line. And take note that I like to threaten the center. So it costs, forces because of my 20 inch threat range, right? It forces you to move up a little bit more cagely, right? So maybe you have to tilt and face it. All right, and then you have to be wary that this regiment might be one shotted by the forsaken right so you maybe you have to place a vermin tide over here to guard against it okay so it 
it manipulates, it causes you to move up cautiously. But then again, most forces have their center forces defended pretty well. So if I were to dive in my Forsaken, it will not do much, right? Unless you are so far up the board, that even my slow forces like these Earth Elementals and these Men at Arms can charge. Alright, because if it's in this situation, I could double charge this Shock Troop Horde to tie it down. Right, and then my Forsaken can charge and kill off this Vermintide. It, it, it is okay to be... Uh, it's, they are okay to be charged by these Shock Troops, but now the Shock Troops might be able to flank this Man at arms, so I will probably hope to roll at least two on my overrun so that I can block it from charging the shock troop, the, the man at arms. Okay, so even if the Forsaken were to threaten the center, it would normally not charge the center unless my slower forces can charge as well. As well. You know, charging the, the Forsaken unit down alone is suicide. Okay, so it just forces the opponent to uh, advance cautiously. But most of the time, even when I'm threatening the center, the Forsaken will try to charge the side, the side units. Why? Okay, so the next question is why? Right. Because if I were to charge at the central unit like this one, I'm just positioning it properly, okay? If I were to charge the central unit like this shock troops, okay, then I will have enemies to the left and right of me, which is not a great position to be in. Okay, this brute should tilt this way. Okay, this brute is okay here. Okay, so then in this position, I either get flanked by both or I get uh, front charged by one and rear charged by the other. So I don't want to jump into the middle of the lines. So I would like to charge at the end of the line. Okay. So that when I turn around, I'm facing the flank of your army. And I, I myself wouldn't be flanked. Okay. So that's very important that I, most of the time, I'll jump at the outermost unit. The furthest out to the flank. And then I'll start to make my way in from there. So maybe I double charge with the beast of nature. And now I'm facing this way. Okay. Or... Um, more likely, it will be this way, something like that, after I kill and turn. Because I'm going to kill this way and turn. Okay, this is just all approximate positioning. Okay, while these guys will be threatening forwards like that. Okay. So, I am with these flying hammers. Once again, I will most likely threaten the center, but charge the side. That tends to be what happens in the games. Yeah. Most likely to guard against the center to force you to move up more cautiously, but I'm gonna charge the into your flanks, your flanking forces, and most likely the outermost unit. So always protect, always uh, assume, uh, or always plan for what's gonna happen if they charge your outermost unit. Okay, so always have something to line up to charge against, uh, whatever kill your outermost unit like this brute over here. Okay, so sometimes the forsaken these flying hammers might deploy dead center so this is a very very defensive uh, positioning once again with all these forces like this right nothing is in charge range let's say this water elemental isn't here this is just two speed 10 threads over here so they are not in charge range so these uh, forsaken will not jump out on their own if they charge this this horde not likely to kill it and then it's gonna get flanked by this regiment and horde and that's probably a dead forsaken okay so so once again if you deploy centrally to me that's not a very great thing to do all right that, that just forces all your central troops to move up more cautiously so once again the cone of influence is here so that causes everything here to move up a little bit more cautiously especially forces on these two ends Okay, but once again, the Forsaken would not charge out until 
it has other forces to charge together with because going in solo spells certain death. So you are as long as you're not exposing flanks or weak points in your advance, that would be great. So what are weak points in the advance? Weak points in the advance are things that he can easily uh this is out. So maybe here. Even this is not okay, so if I tilt this vermin type here. Okay, weak points is something that he can charge and kill easily. Your chair forces, for example. He's gonna kill this brute. And then uh nothing is in in able to charge it. Right? So then with that he has free reign. So he gets a free reposition. Right? Uh hopefully, yep. So everything's out of track range. So as long as you don't uh position present this kind of opportunity to him then he will not have uh, this this forsaken in the middle would not be very useful okay it's just to guard against it just forces you not to give him this kind of opportunities so uh, I explained earlier I'm most likely to charge the outermost units okay and then diving down the center means I get hit by both sides right so try to use because a uh, flying army is usually very elite they have less drops so you if you're not a flying army or alpha strike army you probably has more have more drops so try to see which flank i'm determining to punch through against so get ready that i will delay one side and then move away so in my specific build i like to build i like to deploy fast on both sides okay and i'm usually very lightly deployed in the middle because if i'm a fast army i should make use of my open uh, mobility to get flanks if I'm just deploying in the middle that just gives me the alpha charge right that just gives me first charge for my superior speed but you can easily uh, diminish that advantage by letting me charge only chaff units right vermin tide in front forcing me to charge it and your shock troops come in so I like to punch from the flank so I like to call I think it's commonly called the pincer te technique so you draw the opponents up from the center and then you have very strong side forces to punch in like this so it's like a crab's pincer okay so i like to deploy very heavily on both ends so usually this gets deployed last the the forsaken okay and until the end i will deploy both sides quite equally all right so i have uh, one cavalry on each side although this is the stronger cavalry Okay, one that's the order of redemption and that's just the normal brotherhood knights. One beast of nature on each side. Okay, one sort of uh chef on each side. So this is a Pegasus, while this is a unicorn. It is inspiring, but at the end of the day it's 125 points. I can uh throw it away or sacrifice it to delay things if need be. And then I'll see what the opponent deploys. I don't need to win both sides. As long as one side wins and sweeps in, that's enough. So I've decided that I want to win on the left side. So I don't need to win on the right side, okay? So take note of that. I just need to win one side and swing in. As long as the, the other side doesn't lose, okay? That's the key, doesn't lose. So then I deploy my Forsaken over here. Why I put here? Because I want to move up to get cover from forest in case the opponent have shooting. In this army, not a lot of shooting, but most of the time, my Forsaken takes a lot of shooting damage. So I like to to deploy them and move up, move up through forest and then charge out. So because my, I see my opponent, he has the demon spawn scud over here, shock troop. So I think uh, this will take me a while to chew through, a little bit too long to chew through. So I will deploy heavily on the left side and hope to punch through from there. So this uh, red king player or just my mirror responded in kind by having more drops. So maybe I they will not win, but they will delay me long enough that hopefully they will win the center because they are quite strong in the center. But actually it's only one shock troop horde and one uh, tunnel runner with sharp, sharpness okay so i might keep myself in the forest in the center to delay my opponent until i win on the side which is most of the uh, most of the time that's my uh, strategy so this uh water elemental regiment here is to just help delay the opponent's advance because it does charge 14 inches okay and then it's like a thick chaff so i am able to charge it out and delay them for one more round okay so when i say uh get ready for one side to delay 
So let's say I've decided to win on the left. So I'm going to play a delaying tactic on the right. So I'll be very cagey. Alright, just staying around here for example. But once the opportunity is right, right, then I decided, okay, I need to assist the center now. So there's a very high likelihood that my piece of nature will suddenly just turn and fly 20, for example. Uh, especially fly over here, and turn. And now I'm threatening the side, the center forces like this. So I'll just play KG with my opponent on the side that I'm not intending to win. And hopefully with my superior mobility, I can just suddenly go elsewhere. And then I'll maybe charge this unicorn to delay while the rest of the forces contribute to the middle. This is a little bit harder when the opponent does have a dragon to respond in kind. So, uh, yep, be wary of that. So you see, this is threatening my 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 rear. So I do this. At least this is a flank. It can't charge me. Okay, this is out of, out of uh, charge range. Something like that. Okay. So of course, this wouldn't be in the deployment zone. But this is the rough strategy that I will go for. For the Alpha Strike player, most of the time, it is a mistake to charge at the top of two. And if you are not the first the first one to go, you, it's also probably not a good idea to charge at the bottom of two. Why? Because most, most of the time, only your flying units are in charge range. Your cavalry, sometimes even at speed 8, right? Sometimes it's not in charge range yet. Uh, your large infantry and your infantry are not in charge range yet. Okay? And the opponent has deployed their army and moved up once and they are probably very familiar how to do how to play their first turn right the first turn is probably a move uh, a phase a movement phase that everyone is very familiar with you know you already see oh that's the opponent's threat so i put this here i'm just going to move up forward to meet the threat uh, make him charge me in a way that's not favorable for him so they are very familiar with how to what we call unpack their armies you know how to shuffle their armies forward guarding this unit's flank so on and so forth and if, if you are, there's something for you to charge, unless they made a serious mistake, it's because they want you to charge it, it's probably not a good charge. So what you should do instead is to just shuffle your armies again. You know, because you have nimble, you have speed 10, even if you if it's the calf, it can turn around, it can turn and move 8 inches, face threatening something else. So you just adjust and threaten different things, and that forces the opponents to shuffle around to face your new problem. Right, you ask, uh, you set the question, and they have to answer the the question. And if they couldn't answer it effectively, you know, because of the cramped space, low mobility, no nimble, right? Hopefully, they expose a weakness. Something has got to be flank charge, and then top turn three is where things uh, go off, where the battle happens. Okay, so I have an example to illustrate this. This is me as the uh, order of the green lady player against dwarfs. Okay, so top of one, I moved up, and then my opponent is very familiar with uh, how to deal with, how to push forward. So you notice that he set up this, uh, what I like to call this uh, arc. The units are deployed in this way. There's this curve over here. Why is it curved like this? So no matter what you charge, it's going to be flanked by something else. If you charge this thing, uh, if you charge here, it's going to be flanked by here or here rather. So this curve is where your your units inter uh, protect each other. Okay, he also uh, all these regiments are defense six, so doesn't mind being charged that, right? Doesn't mind being charged that at all, and has three units of it. So I made a mistake of charging at the top of two. Right, part of the reason why I did that also is because he has throwing massive on all these, and he threw and dealt seven damage to my my order of the redemption so i sort of panicked a little bit because of the amount of damage dealt so i thought that i must quickly go in before my unit dies but actually after this round he didn't have much shooting left there is this unit here which are rangers and these are sharpshooters but other than that that's about it i would regen and hopefully i'll regen a bit and that's all the shooting it has left so the problem if i charge right now is this only the order of the forsaken the cavalry here and the beast of nature can charge okay the rest couldn't charge yet even if it's just this uh men at arms and these water elementals okay this unit is not here that was a temporary placement okay 
So when I charged in, and a lot of times, uh, when you're designing on top of two, you say, oh, I can charge this, I can charge that, I can charge this, I can charge that, I can charge a lot of things, and you'll be glorious. So that's usually the first thought at the start of the turn when you're planning. And then after that, you realize, oh, perhaps this charge is not going to queue, that second charge is not going to queue, and then you end up charging the rest. So you thought you have four good charges, and then after eliminating two, you only have two good charges. Right? And then if you charge that in, then you realize that, oh, I just exposed my strong units, and that's just going to be eaten up, because the rest of the army is not there. Okay, so And that's exactly what happened. So I charged Beast of Nature and the Order of Redemption into this shield break, uh, what is this called? Iron Guard. I didn't even kill it, and then you see I'm going to get flanked, and all sorts of uh, pain over here. This one will flank the uh, Forsaken. Okay, and look, my two slower units are back there, and it's not going to be very useful because even so, when my big hammers die, this thing's charging in is not going to put a dent on the iron guard, especially in terrain for the men at arms. So, all this would be dead. Okay, and that's exactly what happened next. All right, uh, even this Forsaken is uh, snaked against this Mastiff, so it's going to get flanked, so it hurts a lot. Okay, so if I rewind one picture back, right? Uh, this is my beast of nature, and this black bar is actually the 10 inch movement. So I could have just moved 10 inches and turned my beast of nature and face this way. Okay, now it's looking at the flank of so many units. And guess what? If it tries to reshuffle, uh, the whole positioning is going to be very messed up. Okay, if you try to turn and face the beast of nature, what about these Forsaken Knights over here? So that's a lot. Uh, so that's. So, so this this by exposing this uh this area for me to land and threaten that would spell a lot of trouble for him if I were to be more patient and hold up hold back and then the next round my men at arms as well as the water elementals would be able to charge something and hold them up right especially with dwarfs they only threaten eight inches I could stay out of the threat range and still be able to get all my charges so the more important thing is that my water elemental and men at arms can hold things up while I charge and kill off some units. So defense, pretty really guard against your outer, guard your outermost units uh, in general against the flanking strategy. So in this picture, I'm guarding against the Salamanders because he does have Clan Lord and Flying Drake. And Phoenix, of course Phoenix is not very punchy, but it does, it is able to contribute. So I set up this, you see this uh, arc, this semicircle cone once again, so that whatever it charge right, something else will be able to flank it. So most important is to protect the outermost one because when if it kills the outermost and face this way, at least the only things that can charge it is in front. Okay, if you were to try to kill this, right, then there's the water elementals and there is the knights on the side. So just make sure that your outermost unit is well guarded. So what I did here, I have my Order of Redemption inspiring it, and even if it kills, I have a Pegasus behind to guard against any shenanigans he might do. So you can also play Refused Flank Deployment. So what is a Refused Flank Deployment? Is that you are deployed towards one si left side or the right side. One side is protected from flank charges by the edge of the table, and you can keep your army more compact. I'm going to show you an example with UB. Okay, also make use of your turret terrain to help you, especially blocking terrain, and in absence of that, forests and hills. So guard your frontage from multi-chargers. Uh, I have an example for this later on. Okay, so cheaper units means more drops, so double layer army. So the first layer will be charged by the flyers, and then you charge it back in, in return. Because flying armies are paying a premium for the, uh, they are paying extra cost for the speed. So with that extra cost difference, you might be able to purchase some chaff that will be able to absorb the die to his alpha charge. Perhaps the way to deploy the red army is this. Let me show it to you. I'm going to pull all the way to the side. Okay, these units can come all the way in here. And that allows me to spread out this a little bit, maybe. Okay, so something like this. So I'm a little bit tighter. So instead of spreading throughout the six feet, Okay, I'm only using about 4 feet, right? I'm only using about 4 feet, about 4 to 5 feet. 
and refuse flank. So I'm deployed against this this left side of the board. So this shock troops will not get flank charged, right? Because there's no way to fit a unit on this edge. So that's the key thing about this refused flank deployment. Okay, so I don't have to worry about so if my units were here, like the first example, the beast of nature might be able to fly past the front arc, you know, and charge. So with my army more compact, it's harder for them to find uh, for this alpha army to find a to find a weakness in my flank and forces. Okay, so I'm also making use of this blocking terrain to protect me because why? Of course, this this knights were to make a roundabout around the terrain, it will take very very long. Even the beast of nature will have some trouble uh, flying across this terrain. Okay, to to get into somewhere threatening. Okay, so this natural terrain provides a natural uh, blockage of my frontage, so I can deploy it a little bit more tightly. So I have a battle report, and this is my usual list at, at two thousand points. Okay, with two beasts of nature here, just take note of that. In my 2003 list, there is an extra water elemental horde and a pegasus. That's exactly 300 points. Okay, so this is my opponent's list. It's a melee heavy goblin list, which also makes use of all the living legends. So that's something funky that my opponent played. Okay, so one uh, very difficult thing about my arm, difficult thing for my army to handle is defense six. Especially when it comes on mincer mobs, which are not that expensive, but hit pretty hard as well. So that that is a very big problem for me in this list that I'm fighting against. So if you look at how my opponent deployed, he did use the re refuse flank strategy. Okay, so he deployed all the way up to this blocking terrain. Okay. So take note the table is including the dark blue patch over here. We were playing on the 40k mat, which was the snow terrain, and then that's a mistake. We should have peeled it off and used the 6x4. Okay, so that allows him to deploy it very compactly. And you see that you know he has units from uh, one end to the other. There's not much gaps in between. Okay. On top of that, he has his uh, two goblin blasters at the corner, ready to blow things up. Should I swing to the center? And on this corner, he has one, he double layered, right? He has this unit of Maguans behind. So in case I jump over or or whatever, he is able to react to that. He also has certain fighting individuals scattered throughout. This was Magua and Juice. Uh, group is somewhere around here. Group is either this one or that one. Okay. So this is my top one I advanced and look at this beast of nature. So I deployed it on the flank, right? And I didn't deploy it too far out because I know that this terrain is here. So my beast of nature needs to swing towards the center, uh, somewhat to the center. I'm still trying to threaten here. Okay, and guess, uh, yep, sh everything shuffled. And guess what? Over here on the side, he used the flank. He used the terrain to block his flank. So my beast of nature can't even charge these two units. So which was a very a very good use of blocking terrain. Okay, and this uh in this corner he on the left side he moved the blaster up for it to be charged because it's just a sacrificial chair. And then his mincer mobs and, and these are trolls will be able to come in. These are magwans. Okay, so I made the mistake of charging at the top of two. I thought I had a lot of good charges. But then after eliminating the f a few charges that I thought were good but weren't, I was left with a very bad, uh, one good charge. And that was not worth it at all. <laughs> okay, So I charged and killed a Rebel Horde, which is only about 125 points, 120 points. Only killed the Rebel Horde and I have to charge 3 units in. Right, The, the Men at Arms, the... Uh, order redemption and the beast of nature into the flank. So I've charged all of that in, okay. And so I have to be get ready to be charged at, okay. So he has uh, I charged the Pegasus into the Goblin Blaster, hoping to kill it, but not a very good odds. But at least stop it right from dealing a lot of damage. So my beast of nature has to take a front charge from, uh, trolls, and then his Magua and Juice is gonna delay my order of redemption. And the Mincer Mob is probably going to go into the Men at Arms. Okay, over on the left side, 
I double charge with Unicorn and Beast of Nature to kill off the Blaster and then to avoid being flank charged or charge that by Mincer Mob, I sacrifice my Thick Chef, my Water Elemental Regiment. Okay, take note though, he has Kuzlo and Metfall looking down this direction. Firstly, safely behind the hill, the forest, and then he's able to charge at this area over here. So that's exactly uh, what he did. Uh, he charged his Mincer let's talk about the center, he charged his Mincer Mob in, and then he put his uh, Winged, okay, the final position was actually here. That prevents a charge from both my Forsaken and uh, this cavalry into the flank of the Mincer Mob. Okay, uh, the position should be here. Okay, because my men and arms are sticking out, so I can't charge, I can't fit into this space over here. Okay, and then because this unit is uh, blocked up over here, my men and arms can't back up to for things to be able to charge in as well. So, yep, set days. <laughs> So the winged was used as chap to block up this area. And so the trolls charge into the beast of nature. And there's a mincer mob over here. These are mincer mobs. Okay, and guess what? The Kuslo and Mad 4 charged into the beast of nature and hindered uh, wavered it. So that really really hurts. Uh, over here, the troll rode very well and just uh, one shotted the beast of nature, which is also very painful. So one piece of nature got one shotted, the other one got wavered, which is sad days for me. So at this point, I killed off the winged, and I think I failed to kill the winged for some reason. I think I rode very very poorly, cause then the you see the mincer mob is charging the flank of the cavalry, that really hurts. Okay, so then the F forsaken knights killed the mincer troop, and then uh, is trying to uh, salvage the situation and win the the side. Okay, but then because I failed to kill this uh, Winged, this, these knights are gonna go down, so I'm also losing the center. I killed off, I killed off uh, Mago and Juice, and I overran into the trolls, but I didn't kill the trolls. So the trolls in return killed me. And there's a group somewhere, so the group is really strong because it deals damage, and then uh, it is. Um, weakness effect, so it really made it difficult for me to grind through units and I j basically lost everything by the t bottom of 4 and my biggest mistake was to charge at the top of 2 because you thought that you have a lot of good charges after discounting the bad ones only half or maybe one third of your forces are going in and those are your expensive forces while the rest are left behind so don't do that, right? most of the time it's a trap so now in this battle report, we're going to talk about uh, another battle that my opponent played very well to gut his frontage from multiple charges and using a lot of more drops to lay up his army. Okay, so this is uh, me on top, Order of the Green Lady versus uh, Redkin, and this is a very popular Redkin MSU player. Scenario is dominate, so you can see this circle over here. So as usual, I sh we both shuffled up, and he is the top player, so he went first. So now, notice how interestingly angled the forces are. So I'll show you a few things. So firstly, my deployment, this piece of nature is out here, right? I didn't deploy all the way in the corner because of the obstruction, the blocking terrain over here, and this forest, which I hope. I thought that he might be able to use it to block line of sight, so I didn't want to be caught out too far out. So that's why I deploy it closer to the center. And same for over here because of this building. Okay, so he squeezed his army towards the central because also this is in uh, this is dominate, right? He has this mutant red fin out on the outside. Okay, so I notice how I collapse my my beast of nature towards the center. Okay, hoping to catch a flank. Okay, and then he moved everything up. Everything is either in the front or no place to land. So for example, this uh, this is a nightmare horde. Uh, my beast of nature couldn't land here in the flank. Okay, I could charge uh, and there's no 50mm space for me to land to charge these tunnel runners as well. There's a vermin tight in front. So everything is very tightly packed. And even his nightmares, right? So I'll show you this. Because of the weapon teams is slightly forwards, 
and then if I'm not wrong, the brute enforcer is slightly forwards. So the frontage to charge this nightmares is only 120. So I can't fit more than one, one charging unit in. Okay, in fact, I can't even fit the Forsaken Knights because they're 150 frontage, the cavalry because they're 125. So the only thing, only thing that can charge in is the water ele elementals or the earth elementals. And I think the earth elementals are out of range. So these are how you can block your frontage from multiple charges. And uh, note the bottom left, he kept this hack pause with Pathfinder pretty far back and pretty far out. So I made the mistake of uh, tightening. So firstly, I started to commit and my forces on the flank started to squeeze more towards the center. And then I made a mistake. My lightning bolts wavered the weapon teams. Water elemental wavered the vermin type. Tango has fury. So this Tango, he actually moved 10 inches to get in the fury bubble so that he can charge. Because if it's wavered, the tunnel runners can't even get in unless it's a counter charge. So that's exactly what happened. Right, so I was hoping to delay the tunnel runners. And then I can charge something juicy because now my uh, I'm forcing things in action by having these two speed or uh, threat 10 units within charge range of enemies this coming round. So that will force some action. Okay, so what he did was pretty amazing. A little bit of luck involved as well. Um, oh, wait, let me rewind that. So my opponent made a mistake on the right flank and I made a mistake on the left flank, which we will see next. But the mistake he made on the right flank is this. Um, he sacrificed, let's rewind, he sacrificed the Brute Enforcer to the Cavalry, right? And then so my Cavalry is going to charge it and my Beast of Nature is going to charge the Mutant Rat Fiend. Okay? If he positioned well, he should have positioned in a way that the Mutant Rat Fiend could uh, withdraw next round and turn enough to charge the Cavalry. So then my Beast of Nature will be out of position. It needs one round to turn around and face the Mutant Red Fiend. And by that time, this Warrior Horde might be inching upwards. Okay. And yeah, so if we position better, this would be the ideal situation. But it didn't. Because I checked that even if he moved out, he couldn't charge the Cavalry. Okay. So then this side is going to go down very soon. So he, he has to step it up. Alright. So... On the other hand, I made a mistake on the left, which I allowed, uh, remember, the move front, move forward and turn to face the flank. So the hack pause moved up and turned to face the flank and none of my units can see it except the unicorn over here. Okay. So at least I still have the unicorn, right? So uh, what happened for the opponent on this side was a little bit of luck involved also. He double charged the tunnel runners and the vermin type, killed off the water elemental, and then it moved its it moves its tunnel runner back D three, and then it moved the the vermin type sideways after killing off, and it blocked off quite a significant portion of its frontage. And the key thing is, I think the tunnel runners must back at least two inches. And then the vermin type must at least do uh, move sideways two inches. But when he did this, the only thing that can charge in is my beast of nature. And I want to charge in because I want to delay it. And the problem is this also: when I charge in and delay it, he gets a free flank charge against me because my center will be here, okay, and his center is here. Then he gets a free flank charge back at me. Okay, which really, really hurts because if it's also front charge, it's not a guaranteed kill. So my Beast of Nature might hold it for two rounds. But if it's a flank return charge, it's, a, it's pretty much a guaranteed kill. So note how tightly tight his formation is. So the, uh, the Nightmares, I think it's in the front charge of the Flyers over here. Okay. And then a lot of things, there's no place to land. Alright. So what I had to do... Uh, so these two speed 10, charge 10 units are in range, right? They have to take action. So a lot of things happen. I charged my unicorn to delay this. 
I charge my Beast of Nature to delay the Tunnel Runners, which is going to get a flank charge in return. Okay, I move my Pegasus. Uh, there's a Pegasus here. It's just shuffling around to wait for a more opportunistic charge. Okay. So because of how tightly things are, right? So, okay, so this Man at Arms charge at the Shock Troops. And it is going to receive two Shock Troop charges in the front. In return, hopefully it can survive one round. Maybe not, but with uh, I think it can survive one round. Fifteen hits. Yep. So then, uh, the center here is where things go terribly wrong. Okay, Earth Elementals charge the. Uh, actually, is this one first? So what I needed to happen was that this Forsaken Knights kill off the brute, but I rode pretty low on the nerf. I dealt 9 damage by road low on the nerf. If I killed it, my Forsaken could move sideways. And my Earth Elementals can face the Nightmares in the front after killing off the uh, War Engine. Okay, but because my Forsaken didn't kill the Brute, my Earth Elementals couldn't face the front. And it's going to eat a flank charge from the Nightmares who are on the hill. So as long as you are on the hill, Charging at something off the hill. It doesn't matter that you didn't charge down the hill. right? As long as you start on the hill and you're charging against something that's not on the hill, you get a thunderous one. So he gets a free thunderous one here even though he doesn't charge off the hill. Yeah, so uh, looking at the right side, I have uh, killed off the Mountain Red Fin, but he's, uh, his uh, warriors are ready to delay. Over here, the Redemption Knights, they actually were not in any good charges, so they started to move. Uh, it started to move and try to get a position next round. Okay, so why I moved here, right, is because this hack pause, they are still nimble even if disordered because they're not flyers. So they could still charge forward 18 inches. Okay. But, uh, or 20 inch, uh, 18 inches, I think. Yep, 18 is correct. Okay, but at least my unicorn has uh, given it some limited angles options as well as taking off its thunderous charge. So I think my Earth Elementals is facing the front. I think I checked that the, the Hack Post couldn't come in because it has to clear both these Beasts of Nature and uh, the unicorn. So there's a limited space here. Yeah, it couldn't come in. But anyway, I didn't. So this is an exposed flank. And so, yep, the Earth Elemental went down. The Hack Pulse decided to move away. While the, the Vermintide charged the Unicorn. Tunnel Runners flanked the Beast of Nature. Now turning to face the center. So my left side is crumbling. But so is his right side. So his uh, Warriors charged at the knights and I think it's a hindered charge maybe it's not I think it's not or oh, I think it is because I purposely have a little bit of a water sticking out here so it's a hindered charge and so they didn't do a single wound to these uh, knights over here which is a relief for me earth elementals went down the men and arms held so in my response uh, this beast of nature because I saw that the warriors didn't do a single wound to the knights Decide to fly over and assist the center instead. So that's exactly what it did. The hack pause, I sandwich it. Hopefully it couldn't charge anything with Pegasus. And I was hoping to kill it off, but it didn't die. And because of the hack pause being here and the nightmares being here, I think the tunnel runners couldn't charge at my Forsaken Knights at least. Okay, so Forsaken Knights take the second round to kill off the brute. Okay, and still the redemption didn't have any good charge target, so it's just shuffling around. So this was a little bit of a waste, but I think it's my mistake for its poor positioning, right? That it didn't fight for two rounds. This is my most powerful unit. Dealt uh, quite a lot of damage to the warriors. It returned one damage to me. Next round. Okay, the man at arms went down uh, expectedly. And this side, lucky on this side, he rode pretty poorly. He dealt only um, seven damage to my Forsaken Knights. Tunnel Runners killed off the Unicorn, that's about it. And on the bottom of 5, it's pretty lucky, my Pegasus, uh, the, the Hack Pulse didn't kill my Pegasus. 
and it's not even wavered. So the Pegasus dealt one damage and killed off the Hack Paws. Okay, Forsaken Knights, together with a flank from the Beast of Nature, killed off the. Killed off this um, Nightmares. And you see that my Beast of Nature taken some damage. So, firstly, it took 4 damage from the Red Fiend earlier. And then now he's shooting dealt some damage. I think the, the Brute Mother has a Staff and then the Tangle has the Fireball. So it dealt even more damage to the Beast of Nature. So even though I killed this, my Beast of Nature is heavily wounded. My, my Forsaken Knights are heavily wounded. No, I think the Tunnel Runners could still come in. Okay, so the Tunnel Runners came in. The Vermintide killed the Pegasus. The Tunnel Runners killed the Fors Forsaken. The let's see my 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 amazing dudes right charged and killed off one shock troops shock troop in return killed off the beasts of nature i killed off the uh you know, what was this i killed off the warriors of, and turn i was ready to get ready to march 16 inches they have pathfinder so move through the forest into the into the zone so it killed until this this is the state all right, uh, I think they're wavered. That's the yellow cross. Okay, but they do have hit strong. I passed the hit strong roll, and this is the juicy part. So I move this knights in. I charge this knights in. I have six unit strength, three from each knights, right? Okay, and I thought that I'm playing for the draw, right? Actually, this has a good chance of killing off the shock troops because I have twenty attacks, uh, hitting on trees and wounding on two with bane chant. Okay, uh, because it has brew of strength, so even if it's uh disordered from the waiver and shaking off the waiver is still disordered, it loses its TC, but I have brew of strength and I have been chant. So and this shock troop, is it wounded? Or he healed from the radiance and drain knife and all. Okay. So still a decent chance of taking it out, but I didn't roll very well. Okay. If I've taken this out, I thought I would have a draw because he has one, two, 3 unit strength and I thought the tunnel runners were 3 then my opponent told me it's actually 2 so he only had 5 unit strength on the table uh, not counting the shock troops and if I kill the shock troops I will have won at the bottom of 6 uh, even after the disaster that happened and the left but I didn't kill off the shock troops so that's another 3 unit strength game ended at the bottom of 6 so I lost this game but it was a pretty interesting game because of you can see how the opponent layers his army block the frontage to prevent me from getting good charges as well as beating me and my own game with the hack pause of moving up and turning to the side so that's uh, pretty painful as well if the hack pause didn't come up right I would have charged the unicorn into the tunnel runner so then my beast of nature wouldn't die so easily right but because of that I must charge into here so the beast of nature must have gone into the tunnel runners okay so that's the painful mistake for my side as well as you can see how they interprotect each other and as long as one thing I didn't kill I'm all jammed up and I get I'm gonna be eating flank charges and so on so that's it I hope all these tips and uh, life examples would be helpful in your quest to learn how to deal with flying and alpha strike armies if you have uh, found this helpful and you have enjoyed the content do press the like button hit the subscribe as well because as Kings of War content creators, you know that our hobby is so niche that it isn't a very wide audience. So we're only doing this for the people to gain something out of it. And by hitting that like and subscribe, it really uh, encourages us to keep doing these videos. Because there's really not a lot of uh, Kings of War players watching these videos. And so every like and subscribe really encourages us to continue making these videos, which are a lot, a lot, a lot of work. And... Yeah, and I'll see you in the next video.